Hi. Hi. Um, it's, it's really nice to be here. My talk tonight to OpenCJS is called Front End Wheel Turns. That felt like a suitably sort of momentous concept for what I'm actually going to talk to you about. I'm Jed. Um, I put up this slide in my deck thinking that I'd introduce myself, not realizing that would have comprehensively happened by now. But I'm with Boris, one of the two co founders of ThinkMill, which you may have heard of. Um, but uh, so, a little bit of quick background around me. Um, I actually started, I gave my first talk to 10 years ago. Since then, I've had two gorgeous girls. This one on the, the right here, she brought COVID home with her from daycare about two and a half weeks ago. This is the first time I left my house since then. I'm not actually infectious. I haven't been all week, but I've, I'm, I'm, I don't know how I'm, if I'm making any sense, that is a miracle. <laughs> I should not be here doing this, but I am because I'm really excited to talk to you about some stuff. So 10 years ago, let's start not at the beginning, but let's just rewind a bit. Um, JavaScript. Uh, we, I have been using JavaScript since I think 1997 back when I remember when IE4 came out with DHTML behaviors and it was very exciting. So I'm, I'm that bad at this. Um, but 10 years ago was for me the start of what I've called the Node.js era. Um, and this was actually, I was working with John back then and we were using things like ColdFusion and Java in the back end and suddenly I'd been writing JavaScript my whole career on the front end and I could use it to do interesting things on the back end. That was really fun. Um, we used tools like Express. Suddenly JavaScript was for more than just making a button change color when you hover your mouse over it. We could build servers and we could build whole websites. And so this is sort of more oriented towards the front end, but the point is we started using JavaScript on the back end to make our front ends. It got a little bit confusing for a bit there, but I'm gonna cover that in a bit. We used, uh, I, I use these things called Jade, which is now pug templates. And the whole idea was that it was kind of like any other template language you'd run, whether it's PHP or ColdFusion or something, except it would be executed in JavaScript. We also use things like less or SAS, depending on which flavor you prefer. And we had this wonderful tool called jQuery that we would use to sprinkle some interactivity into our front ends with JavaScript. Um, and life was good. We would get data with our jQuery from some REST, usually REST, preferably REST APIs, don't make me deal with that so nonsense, particularly not from JavaScript, nobody wants that. Um, and basically there, there sort of emerged this whole stack, like we could do things like routes and templates and local variables, we had the middleware stack that we had to manage, we would do form processing with that, we would use this thing called Flash, which is not that Flash, not the Flash you're thinking of, but uh, connects flash, which would let you sort of temporarily show this form has been submitted just for the next request using session. It was very fancy and based on Rails, uh, which also meant that we had to do things like session management and deal with static files. And also if anyone has used Grunt, we had a Grunt build system that would sort of get our less or our SAS and put it in our middleware stack and make our websites work. And it was really fast coming from particularly a Java backend. Node was really exciting because it was super lightweight and it was pretty scrappy, but it was also like you could just boot up a server in less than a second and you could be serving requests really quickly. And it felt like this whole new era not having to wait for a Java app to boot. It was also hard, all that stuff I just mentioned, to do anything on the front end. You kind of had to learn about all this back end stuff. Um, and it was really super complex and, and very green, um, but it was fun. It was really fun and it was, for me, really empowering suddenly to be able to traverse the whole stack as someone who'd been working on the front end my whole career and just like had to poke John when I wanted an API changed. And we built a thing. And 10 years ago, uh, we built a thing called Keystone.js, which actually came out of that whole mess that I just described to you. And the thing about Keystone was originally it was just trying to consolidate all of the, what we now call non-differentiating work that we had to do. So stuff like the way you would process forms and pass variables to templates, deal with session, deal with having a database. Um, but also something that we'd been missing and that was missing is was the very first Node.js content management system that existed. Because all of the other more mature backends, like whether it was PHP or uh, ASP, they all had CMSs and Node didn't. And we actually built the first here in Sydney and launched it at SidJS. I gave a talk at SidJS 
not like this one. I hadn't just had COVID and I could think straight. But I, um, I got up and we sort of, it had been like a one pager with some JavaScript based animation on it, doing fancy things, sort of showing off how JavaScript is great at maths. And we turned it into a website that would actually list the upcoming, <laughs> you get it, you get it. Uh, the, we, we would show what the meetup was that was going to come up next month and who'd be talking and other interesting, useful stuff like that. And Sharky could actually log into a backend and content management. And it looks sort of like this. This is a late screenshot from 2016. But um, yeah, it, was, it was pretty good. You could even log in and create an account and register an RSVP. This is before we used meetup.com for everything. And it looked like this. If anyone wants to get a little bit nostalgic here, um, you can sort of see the shape of the code. And I I, you don't actually need to be able to read it if you're up the back, but you know, we would sort of define queries and we would, in the JavaScript, be talking to a model which was in the ORM that talks to the database and finds the meetups where the state is active and sort them reversing the start date. Things like that would happen. And then we'd pass that to these locals and we'd have a pug template which looks like this which would get that data and interpolate it into the template and actually end up with the website that I showed you. This is how that era was defined for me. I've got one meme in this talk, enjoy it. <laughs> um, JavaScript everywhere. Uh, and this really was the start of like the Node.js meetup started and I remember someone coming along and talking about how they were building a robot submarine that used an Xbox controller and the web, <laughs> web gaming APIs to send video back up to the boat. They were using it to explore stuff. And I was like, JavaScript is everywhere for the first time. It actually achieved, funnily enough, what Java didn't. <laughs> uh, the, the, the little scripting language that could. Um, but also, okay, so that, that node era of pug templates and locals and express didn't last for too long because nine years ago, I gave another talk at CJS about React. And it was actually, I, I think, the first talk about React, not by Facebook people in Australia. Because I found it, because of Keystone actually, we were looking at different ways to drive a better admin UI and we stumbled onto React. And we're like, this is actually really, really cool. Um, it felt very different to jQuery and everything else. And we kind of explored that and that really changed things. The first thing that happened was people put code like this up in presentations at JS Const and everyone threw up in their mouth and said, what? And the first question was like, are you kidding? We're never actually gonna wanna write code that looks like that, HTML should not go in our JavaScript. And then the second question was like, if you got past that first question, like how is this even gonna run? There's no way that the browser understands what this is. You've got angle brackets and using classes and browsers don't support classes yet. That's only in the JavaScript spec, it's not actually been rolled out. But with it, um, another Australian project, six to five, came out and that would take ES6 and turn it into ES5 that would run in browsers. And suddenly we had to do this thing called transpiling our JavaScript so that our JSX angle brackets would turn into function calls and it would actually sort of implement polyfills for all of the new stuff in all of the old stuff the browsers did support. And that became Babel, which you probably still use today if you're doing anything on the front end. Um, we also kept using Grunt to run all these tasks and all these build systems, and then that turned into Gulp, which used Node.js streams, and things got interesting. We had this thing called Browserify, and then of course Webpack came along. Um, and you probably still hate Webpack to this day, but it did a lot of good stuff for our ability to like bring sanity to this new stack that we were working in, and, and pull new features that we shouldn't be able to use yet and make them possible. And we moved fundamentally from the concept of plugins on the front end to components. And components are, they, they kind of changed everything. So I think of this next phase as the component era. We've gone from the Node.js era to the component era. And um, it also brought on this concept of like, well, what about the server and the client? And we went on a bit of a journey there because where we were using JavaScript to generate our client-side code on the server and then sprinkle it with some separate code on the client using jQuery, suddenly we had this concept with the reactive render to string and that meant uh, what we called for a while isomorphic JavaScript, which became universal JavaScript, which basically means that the same code is gonna run on the server and on the client. And this was another big innovation of the React era. Um, that's not just components. So the client-side code would now also run on the server, sort of, um, and that was cool, because one of the problems with client-side code is it's not indexable. Google doesn't like it. 
and it's really slow. You've got to wait for your bundle to download and parse and execute and then make a query and get some data and show some stuff. It's slow. So a whole lot of other stuff happened during this era, like we really went nuts on state management. If anyone's still got Redux in their code base, my heart goes out to you. Um, but you know that brought concepts like time travel debugging, and we got into CSS and JS. We had an explosion of different bundlers to try and solve the Webpack problem that we created out for ourselves. Component distribution was a really big one. Like we used to be able to get, um, you know, you could sort of download the source code for a jQuery plugin and stuff around with it a bit, and maybe add some more script files to your head. But actually, along with all of these other things, we got the ability to bundle and publish components to npm, and now you can just you know, npm install something like React Select and just drop it in a page and it works, styling and all. And this is like our ability to share code with each other got significantly transformed by this component era. It's probably one of the defining factors for me of this change. And of course, things like GraphQL came out as well um, and sort of started really changing the control of how we request and manage data. The, the, it moved from the server deciding what data to send to the client getting to ask for the data that needed, which opened up a whole new sort of round of innovation on what we can actually do. And really, the story here is how much empowerment we have as front-end devs across all of this stuff to work with these technologies and not kind of have to live with a whole lot of separation between the front-end and the back-end. But it keeps going. There's Flow, which, of course, quickly became TypeScript. And this is the component era. Um, and this led to some really cool things like design systems. That's kind of possible, what we now think of as a design system back in the jQuery time was really just like bootstrap and copying and pasting a bunch of CSS files around. Not scalable. These scale really well. We can do some cool stuff with them. And also the rich, the really rich front ends that we can build because of the way that all this complexity is starting to become encapsulated. This is sort of the journey that we've been on. Lots of APIs and of course, coming back to one of my favorite topics, content management. <laughs> Headless content management became a thing because we no longer want in a CMS our templates like on that first instance that I showed you. We no longer actually want our servers loading the data from the database and then rendering our page, whether that's WordPress or Kentico or something else. We want to just query for the content that we want as data now, and we'll take care of putting that into our front end ourselves, thank you very much. Give us a GraphQL API, let us query our content from that. We can use it in our React front ends. We can also use it in our mobile apps or whatever. It's a really, really powerful move. And server rendering was sort of OK, except this is the problem. This is where, this is what that whole round didn't actually get us to. Because like, it's really just client rendering. Um, you, you, you've moved from server rendering to client rendering data from an API, but the server rendering is a lie. It's just like, it's an optimization. It's being able to run the client code that's going to run on your client on the server so you can send down HTML. But you've still got all the security issues. You've still got the constraints of dealing with, like, this is going to run on the client. Everything I write is going to happen in a browser. I can't talk to my database. I can't do a whole lot of stuff here. Uh, we're really writing client-side code. It just happens to be optimized. It's really a technical implementation detail that Jira happens to send you you know, your boards before the JavaScript is loaded. It's just because they spend a lot of money getting AWS servers to pre-process that for you so it loads faster and I can see the license in the room smiling. I was part of that project. It was, it was big. <laughs> anyway, so as ThinkMill, we built a few things in this era. We built a select component, like the component distribution thing that I talked about. You might have used this one. We also built Keystone, <laughs> again. Um, and we turned it from a framework for sort of content management and server-side stuff into a headless CMS and an API platform. That was really exciting. And once more, I came back to CJS and I gave a talk. And how am I going to demonstrate what we've just built other than to make it relevant to the community by building a new CJS.com? This happened. And it looked like this. And that, um, that's the website that Sharky mentioned that Oh, you give a man a CMS, you can't get him to upload meetup details, I tell you what. <laughs> but it's been fun. Um, and this is what Keystone, I actually managed to log into the instance, and you know, here's the, the talks that are in, and there's Simon's talk, which is coming up. And you can see, I, I, I brought up the inspector when I was looking at this earlier, and you can see what's going on, right? Like, you navigate to the events page, and the first thing it does is fire off a query and loads that data over an API which comes in over the GraphQL 
it's JSON and we render it. There's a spinner that shows for a while before this shows up because now we've got a lot of data and I don't think we ever got around to putting pagination in there. And this is what the code looks like. It's changed a lot since those first screenshots that I showed you. Now we're defining GraphQL queries and we're passing that data into React components. Like the shape of this code is so different, almost unrecognizable as JavaScript. But here we are. JavaScript got good in this era. It's been really fun being a JavaScript developer during this time. But this, uh, the client-server divide did not. <laughs> We've gone from only being able to do things on the server to only being able to do things on the client, and they both have trade-offs. We got good at it. We got a front-end stack. I like to think of this stack like a tasty stack of pancakes. We've got our React layer, we've got our components, we've got our GraphQL API, we've got our GraphQL server, we've got our ORM, we've got our database, we've got a stack. But actually, there's so much stuff in this stack that it's really more like this. It's a big stack. And we sort of haven't actually come that far since where we were at the start of my talk. You have to learn a lot of stuff, you have to know a lot of stuff in order to work in this stack confidently, and that's tricky. What do we do about that? Well, a few years ago, Someone by the name of Guillermo came up with a concept called Next.js, which is a website framework for React. And it was actually pretty specifically addressing how complex this stuff had become. And his founding concept, because he goes back through like Mootools, which I didn't mention to sort of the PHP era, did a lot of stuff with WordPress back in the day. Um, and he had this idea of like PHP, but make it JavaScript. Like this almost kind of rose-colored glasses version of the past that says, wasn't it great when we could just make a template and upload it to a server and it would be on the internet? And it's so much harder, more complex these days. The trade-off for all of the cool stuff we can do is the, the number of tools and the difficulty. What if we could bring that back but make it JavaScript? And so Next.js implements things like file-based routing and always on SSR and client-side transitions and the ability to do data fetching on the client or the server side and actually pick it. Um, something called hybrid rendering where you can pre-generate pages so they come off the edge really fast, but you can also handle dynamic requests on a per route basis in your app, sort of transparently. Um, and also things like deploy the ledge, of course, like this is a front-end talk, so I'm not gonna go into the things like serverless that happen at the same time, but bringing that, um, that speed and that edge efficiency to what we can do with our front ends now is super powerful. So Next.js started down this journey. I'm not sure if they knew ahead of time that it was gonna end up here, but they made some really good calls. I actually was having a chat with Guillermo a couple of years back and he said this thing to me and I was like, I want, the, I want you to have that on a shirt. He was like, I made Webpack an implementation detail. And that's actually something that is very true of Next and incredibly powerful. Like all of the complexities, like no one thinks about that anymore. We do. There's a lot of Webpack going on behind the scenes in Next to this day, although they're start, or nearly moving away from it, but it doesn't matter to most of this anymore. It's just an implementation detail that Next happens to use Webpack unless you've opted it into the new build system, in which case it happens not to now. And the line got blurred between front end and back end successfully for the first time in this whole journey. Because I'm writing one code base now. And the uh, code I'm writing on the front end, the code I'm writing to run on the back end are in the same files, but they're doing different things and they're able to use different dependencies. This is really, we're actually getting close to solving the hardest problem that we've found for ourselves in the history of JavaScript on the internet now, today. And that's, so you might have heard of the React team talk about these things called server components. It's very mysterious. Basically, it looks like this. You also might have seen people whinging about this on Twitter. And the complaints about this reminded me of the complaints when React was first announced, where people are like, are you serious? I don't want this code in my code base. Of course, you shouldn't write that in your code base. But we can put all sorts of stuff in place that makes this a really, really good and really powerful idea. This code is going to run from the server. We can define a function that is a component that just runs a query to select data straight from our database and then loop over that and output it as JSX. Like, poof. right? Even when we had server-side rendering a year ago, we couldn't do this. This wasn't a thing. This code's not gonna run on the client ever. The computer that runs this code is just gonna send the resulting HTML and some state information to the client via the framework. 
you can do server things. But if you wanted to do like a use state here, which is tracking something, uh, you can't do client things. Except that you can do client things, you just put this use client directive up the top now. And that turns it from a server component to a client component. And you can import your client components from your server components and Next just sorts all of this out for you. It's really incredibly neat the way you can actually reason about when code needs to be different and not worry about it when it doesn't. So this is like a really, really big evolution for us as front-end developers. You can do client things, you can do server things. And a few months ago, so with all of everything I've just told you, I've told you so I can tell you this. A few months ago, we built a new website for ourselves. We decided to build a new thinkmill.com. And we threw all of the stuff that we normally use out the window. And we decided to just, like every now and then we want to experiment and just make sure that we've learned the sort of stuff that we're not using on the big projects where we need to know what we're doing already. And so we used our website for this and we built it. And we built it using a uh, Next.js alternative called Astro, which is really cool. So if you're sleeping on Astro, don't. Google it after the talk and check it out. It's amazing. Um, Astro is sort of like Next 13, but not. It's um, but it, it's very much similar concepts, components, server-side rendering, a meta framework. Really nice to use. Takes care of a lot of stuff for you and is designed more for content websites. Tailwind, which really solves a lot of the complexity around CSS. Uh, React, of course, for the interactive bits. We're still using React. And Markdoc, which Dinesh's talk is going to be about. I won't talk too much about that, but Markdoc's, I love it. We didn't use CMS, funnily enough, for a company that's been like building some of the leading open source CMSs in the space for a decade. But we didn't want to use a CMS because we just wanted to write the code, find out what happens. And this is what happened. Our code looks like this. This is actually the source code for our homepage. Um, and if you scroll down, you'll see why starting with a CMS was not a good idea it would have predisposed us to a particular content shape and a generic set of components for rendering that content, and we wanted to be a lot more expressive. There's a lot of really cool, neat little touches on our website that you may not even notice if you look at it. We had a lot of fun building it, and you know, a lot of websites are like that. The line between what you want to be generic and what you want to be handcrafted is blurred. And as things like Next13 or Astro have come out and they're maturing, we're able to do much more interesting stuff with them by writing code. Astro's mission is actually to make it so easy to write code for a website that nobody needs to use a CMS, which is a cool mission. And um, one of my favorite experiences around this whole website, this little story I've got for you, was actually me and Boris jamming on, like we were trying to figure out what we were gonna write on that homepage, what's the, what's the say to introduce us to people? And we started out writing the content in Notion and it wasn't real. And then uh, Boris is the lead designer. I'm sort of like the head of technology, so he's not a programmer. But he got a copy of the suggest, uh, not the suggest site, the, the ThinkMill site. We helped him get a dev environment set up. I showed him how to use VS Code. This is over Zoom. Picture us at like 9 o'clock at night, sitting on our respective couches with Zoom open. And we've got VS Code live share open. He's in the JSX with me, editing content. It's all running live and hot reloading on his computer, which is being tunneled into my computer. So every time he writes some content and mashes Command S, my browser refreshes and I can see what he's just done. And we're actually really collaborating. And it was the most productive collaboration session on content I've ever had in my life. It was really, really fun. And it was all real. It was our actual website. And when our screens are set up like this, and I was like, this is so cool. This is so much further ahead because code got so good and front-end stack got so good that we can do this now and I don't ever want to go back. I don't want to go back to building a website out of bits and pieces and then handing it like to asynchronously to someone who's going to write some content and not be able to express themselves and ask me as a developer to do something else and pass that through design. Like, I love you all, but let's all just get on a Zoom and jam on this stuff together because we can now. Everything got good. And this is kind of where we are. So everything got good. What I mean is like if you need a page, stick it in the pages directory. Across frameworks, that's consistent, whether it's Nuxt, Next, Astro, whatever. Got components, pull them off NPM. There's so many high quality UI libraries that you can just start with today. 
CSS, I've been saying this for a while now, but just use class names. <laughs> uh, data, just pull it from the database, right there in your component. Is it fast? Yes, it's so much faster than it ever could have been before. Um, we should have some types. We use TypeScript, it works. New features, can we use new features? Remember when you used to check can I use.com all the time? I barely do that anymore because everything's evergreen these days and IE's finally been killed. And you know, we can just have, ha we, we can have nice things finally. Is it safe to do this? Yes, of course. When Boris and I are jamming, we've got our sort of lead design co-CEO writing code. Is that going straight to production? Absolutely not. He's got to open a pull request. <laughs> there's, branch preview, there's branch previews that we can open and look at like, what is this going to look like when it gets deployed? And then one of our developer team has to approve that before it gets actually merged. And then it gets merged and the tests get run and it gets all built by CI and gets put on the internet. Can we collaborate? Yes, like never before. This is super exciting. Do we have to worry about state management to do simple things like loading data from our CMS? No. Do we have to get GraphQL in the stack for just ThinkMill's website? No. Do we have a request waterfall? No. Do we have gigabytes of JavaScript that we need to download before we can show anything on the page? No, not anymore. The ThinkMill website with Astro doesn't load any JavaScript until it needs it. And this stack that was previously getting you know, pretty unwieldy, it's been flattened. This is what's going on in front end these days. This is where that front end wheel has turned to. This is where we're at. Except for one thing, the headless CMS. If we wanted to actually content manage this and Boris wasn't comfortable writing JSX with a co-pilot, um, we would have been excluding all of our other contributors in the company who aren't slinging code every day from contributing to our website. And that is very quickly where we ended up. The clunky workflow that starts in Notion as content changes, gets handed to developers and gets pushed online. So no, there is actually no solve for this. So we've been watching this front end wheel turn and kind of observing what happens when it does. And we were like, what if we could content manage our code base? Huh, yes, I like that idea. So we built something. <laughs> um, introducing key static. This is a new project from ThinkVel, which is solving this specific problem. And it's solving it with all of the background that I just described, plus a decade's worth of experience building Keystone and a lot of that DNA uh, for this new era of front end. And we're actually really excited about it. So of course, we built acidjs.com again. What else are we going to do? Let me introduce you to our new website community. And um, do, 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 do. there it is. This is pretty much the stack that I was describing. Um, we've got Next.js 13 doing server-side stuff. It's being deployed to Vercel. And this is tonight's meetup and the talks with it. And it's basically just a shiny lick of paint on CJS so that Sharky can finally tell us what the talks are going to be next month when he knows, and also where it's going to be held, which is very exciting. <laughs> um, how is he going to do that? So let me show you what else we put in here. Um, and now, before I go any further, I'll ha I have the link in a slide subsequently, but this is, of course, open source. It's on GitHub. Um, this, the, the intent behind this is ThinkMill has built it, but the intent is for this to belong to the community. So it's open source and we would love help and contributions. And if anyone wants to actually get in, like have a play with the stack that I've just told you about or see where we're up to with it, try these new toys and help make Sydney's JavaScript community website better, please, we would love to have a chat with you. Um, anyway, here's, we, we got to write a readme as well so you know how to run it, that would help. But uh, look, there's one problem with this, which is that I, have had COVID and didn't tell anyone what I was going to talk about. So let's just try and fix that. Welcome to Key Static. Um, it's going to take a second and realize that I've just hit it in a new browser and I'm not logged in, but 
there's no database behind this CMS, right? It's just editing content. The static part of key static is about statically analyzable source code like JSON or YAML or Markdoc. So I'm gonna log in with GitHub. And because I have access to that repo, it means that I have access to that repo just with a very different looking IDE to the one that you're used to. I can come into talks, and I can come into, oh yes, we do have dark mode, isn't that nice? Um, okay, front end space is changing, and this is, this is my talk, so I'm just gonna quickly update the name of it, which can be, um, what did I say? The front end wheel turns or something silly like that. Um, and now I'm gonna add some stuff in here. So like, what's my talk been about? Let's just go, it's a pancake stack. Um, which is turning into soon just one pancake. Very good. Okay, um, I'm gonna save that. I'm not gonna save that because I'm on the main branch. Remember what I said about is this safe? Branch preview protections. I'm gonna create a new branch, Jed, Jed's talk, update. Cool, create branch and save. Fingers crossed, because I hope this works. May not work. There was a new release earlier today and I think actually there's, do, 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 do. yes, it worked, sweet. Okay, so I got some content in here, and this is actually like a markdown slash markdog state for the National Talk field, and we're gonna quickly just add some more stuff in like, hello world, and heading, and um, I can use shortcuts like that to create a heading, and then I can create a list. Okay, let's save that. And now, as you can see, I'm updating this branch, and what I can do is I can create a pull request. So the idea is that we're making things that were previously inaccessible to people who weren't developers, accessible to the whole team. And we've had our design team, and our, like other people who aren't developers think they're actually updating our website through this as well, which is really cool. And so you can see, this is the code that's changed there. Um, it's updated the front matter, and it's updated the contents of that um, that mark doc below. And so if I actually create a pull request, the other cool thing about this is it's uh, all of the rest of the things that are really nice about our front end workflow these days, um, they become part of this. So CI is gonna run. You can see that the cell is currently building a preview of this change. Um, and if we give the cell a second, it should come back and actually have Let's see what happens here. Come on, Vassal, do things. Hurry up, I'm giving a talk. We'll check back on that in a second. Um, just gonna put this down for one second so I can do something that's actually not silly. There we go, now that's something that I'm actually okay. If someone can approve that PR as well, I'll, I'll show the whole workflow, um, now that it's not ridiculous. But if we visit this deployment, like this is what's so cool about, we haven't changed anything about this stack, and so to have a CMS that is just coupled in with the rest of the front-end deployment processes that we're used to, like that's just a code change that I've used something that looks like a CMS to be able to do. And that's what we are currently building. So you can actually have a play with that. And because it's open source, um, once you've connected with GitHub, you should even be able to open KeyStatic, but you won't be able to save anything unless you ask someone very kindly for push access, which we'd be happy to grant anyone in the community. So the point here is that like, along with the rest of the front end changes around back end, front end server side, client side, all of these things, ideally your default constraint is that there's no separation. But in this case, the way we mean that is, ideally there's no separation between um, 
the way we're doing stuff like editing content and the way we're doing stuff like writing code. What if we removed that huge divide that's always existed between that in the same way that tools like Astro and Next have removed that great divide that used to exist between front end and back end, or rather client side and server side. So you can use the same workflows, the same history, the same preview processes, the same power that we've got in writing things like React components that can query databases are also non-destructively editable where it makes sense to be able to edit them in a CMS. And now we're on the same team. People who aren't technical can contribute to the code base in a really meaningful way. That's more accessible. And this is like we're sort of exploring this new space and we're thinking of it like kind of a low code, high code hybrid model where you can actually have both. And it just works. So it doesn't actually change your code base to introduce it. It's a dependency like Storybook is. You don't have to change your framework. And most importantly, you don't have a split source of truth between the smatterings of code that always exist around your components in your code base and the stuff that's coming out of your CMS. So I, I don't think you've ever seen a CMS like this unless you've tried the alpha. We haven't been super quiet about it, but um, if you haven't tried it, you probably haven't seen something like this before. Keystatic.com, check it out. Give it a star. <laughs> I said this in my first suggest talk 10 years ago, but like I've always loved the thought of like the 100 people that you can have in this room. If you're going star something, it's enough to get something trending on the homepage of github.com. I just harness that little local community spirit and go give it a star. The, the GitHub is a link from here. Um, and also, this is our new website. Um, courtesy of Thinkmail. So we're just getting started. There's a heap of stuff from here that we're really keen to put in. We just launched new docs. We just launched a new CLI. We've got um, a new Markdoc editor in progress, stuff like auto-saving cloud images, multiplayer editing live preview. These are all things that we're playing with. Here's some design work that we're doing around a, a significantly improved version of that editor, as well as some of the Figma stuff we're exploring, um, you know, better CMS style layouts. and live preview, multi-pane editing, stuff like that. Thank you for listening. Oh, I've got a merge PR, yeah, cool, all right. Let's do that, here we go. Um, pull requests, just hook update. Oh, this is fun. You write better like copy, it. please make it pop. <laughs> yeah, yeah, all right, very good. Squash and badge. Okay, let's just, let's get that done. Here we go. Woo, all right. So CJS.com will shortly have an actual description of my talk coming soon. I'm not gonna sit here mashing refresh, but edited the source code live and merged it in GitHub without actually opening my code editor. Pretty cool. All right, I'm gonna get off the stage. Thanks again for listening. Actually, well, uh, nah, you can just clap, that's all. <laughs> <laughs>